everyone that's tuning in. Um, this is how serious this is. YouTube actually knew that we were having this meeting and live streaming on YouTube and it worked last night but I went to go put it on uh, for the meeting today and it didn't work. So there's no live streaming on YouTube so we're here on Facebook today and uh, this is the first official People's Party meeting. And I want to thank Randy Furman uh, for opening your home to us. To, You're welcome. To be here. And um, our, I am the acting chair of the party, so I will be help facilitating the meeting and kind of guiding us through this party. It's all kind of new for us. Uh, I know that there's feelings of excitement, and I know that there's feelings of fear, and I know that there's confusion and frustration, and there's a lot to feel through. So I'll be helping kind of guide us through that, and from here, uh, it can really go wherever we want it to go, and that's for all of you that have been so kind and generous with your time to be here in these seats with us tonight, and for all of you guys watching from around the country. Uh, it's equally as important that we hear from you, um, you have the ability to comment and share your thoughts and ideas, questions and concerns at each point of the meeting. Uh, and Eddie is going to be our acting uh, secretary for the first meeting, Laughing Eddie Lobo. And um, Eddie, if you would please uh, go ahead and since this is our first meeting, do a roll call and just ask everyone to say their name, uh, where they're from, and maybe just uh, how their day's been going. <laughs> Shall we start with you? Sure. Okay. Uh, my name is Morgan Stiff. I'm from North Carolina. I've been in uh, LA for 15 years, and uh, I just would like to say, you know, I'm I'm here because I think, you know, we need new solutions, new answers. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I'm Maya Mel. I am born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I haven't left yet. Um, I'm happy to be here. Super stoked for what this meeting. Whatever we come to, I'm excited for because let me tell you what we're doing now ain't working. So whatever we come to, it's gonna be better than what's happening right now. So excited to be here. And there's, oh. I see myself right there. Oh, yeah. I can turn this it on you. Hold on, let's go. turn it on. <laughs> Our amazing camera Hello, man. Hello, this is Henrik Bartanian. Mm -hmm. I'm. I lived in LA for 30 plus years, and I'm basically here to see how we can help create a change because, like I said, what we have is not working. Yeah. I'll take that down. All right. <laughs> and then uh, I'm Phil, <laughs> and uh, I'm from. I'm an Angelino. I was born and raised in uh, Northridge in the San Fernando Valley, and uh, I'm I'm here to listen uh, and to learn. And I've had an outstanding day, but I do have to leave early to go to work. Uh, I'm a healthcare worker, and I believe in socialized medicine, so yes. Yes. that's all I can say about that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Raquel Esparza. I'm a little teary-eyed. Um, songs make me teary-eyed. Um, I'm here to basically represent um, both the LGBT community uh, as an ally to also find out how we can meet in the middle, and I've been watching everything and paying attention, so I'm excited to just present a new conversation. Me? Eddie! I'm Carlton Smith, and I'm just here for the food. <laughs> no, I'm Eddie. Um, I work in the entertainment industry. I've known Ronnie for many years, so I'm looking very forward to seeing everybody moving forward with this and getting some things out there and uh, see where we can go with this. Hi, I'm Randy Furman. Uh, I'm an event planner caterer, and uh, this is my house, and we're just uh, birthing a nation. Yes. 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 We're in labor right now. Yes. We are. <laughs> we're just saying our name and where we're from and maybe something about your day. Okay. Hi, I'm Jennifer Lee. I'm from Mississippi and um, I'm studying to be an actress. And I met him because I used to be his Lyft driver. So looking forward to getting to know everyone and seeing where this night goes. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm Ronnie Kroll, and uh, a lot of you uh, are my friends and my family and know me personally. A lot of you have known me from my various hats that I've worn over the years. Uh, everything from modeling to acting, um, working with uh, Laughing Eddie on creating friend movement, and most recently, uh, 
my political aspirations and uh, really they come from a place of genuine concern about where we are in our country today and it really makes me sad and it makes me frustrated mm -hmm. and it makes me angry and much like so many people across this country I am angry and I'm trying to figure out what to do with it because I don't want to be angry at other people for being angry, but I'm finding myself getting more angry. <laughs> and I said, there has got to be a better way. I don't have all the answers. I'm not a perfect person. But I'm here tonight, and I'm grateful to all of you for sitting here at the table, and I thank you, thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you for being here and starting the conversation, because I think it's one that needs to be had. We deserve better as a nation. The world deserves better from their leader, from the leader of the free world. And I feel like we have so much more in common than we are seeing right now. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing that this anger and this hate and this confusion, it's ripping us apart at the seams. So tonight, I just want to have a conversation with you guys. You know, we all have different perspectives. We come from different backgrounds. We have differing political views. Listen, I've got friends that identify as Republicans, that identify as Democrats, and everything in between in the independent spectrum. Uh, but we have to start putting people first mm -hmm. before party. You know, it, it really frustrates me to see this partisan uh, radical hatred, this divisive language that's being used on behalf of leaders on both sides. We could get into an argument and debate about who's doing it more, but that's not really here or there. It's being done, and there's no one stepping up in the sandbox to say, I'm going to be the adult. You know, we may agree to disagree on things, but we're going to figure it out. And we're going to find a way forward. So tonight, it's all about identifying the need for a viable third party in the United States. And when I say viable, there are a lot of political parties that have, you know, started. And there's the Green Party and the Libertarian Party. And there's at least 20 that are active right now, in addition to the major parties. Um, but a viable party, one where we unify independent-minded thinkers so that this independent machine could contend with a Republican or Democratic machine, right? So we're going to identify the need tonight. We're going to talk about the need for an independent voice to come to the forefront and help us heal and unite as a country. And further after that, after we have that conversation, we're going to be talking about nominating a party chair and then creating subcommittees. Because this is big league, right, Donald Trump? This is big league. And what we're going to do is we're, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> I don't want to lead the group. <laughs> I've got a lot of other things. And, and just because I can do it doesn't mean that I should be doing it. There's a lot of other capable leaders at this table and in our friend groups that if not, you know, today we may have some names. At the next meeting we have some more names. People will be submitting themselves to be considered. And we're going to figure that all out together. So, I wanted to start by just, I don't have, just to, to conserve paper, um, we'll do a little bit of sharing. So this is a Wikipedia how-to, right? In the University of YouTube and Wikipedia age, um, this is how to create a political party. And, let's see, let's okay, put that here. And you can go ahead and uh, I might share with you. Okay. I have one more here for myself. Uh, it's literally uh, talks about starting a political party from start to finish. And there are some steps that you have to take in order to do that. Um, but before that, I just want to open up the table to just how you're feeling about what's going on in the country today. Uh, what you're seeing in the media, what you're seeing from the major parties. And um, just your general thoughts. Let's just start there. Anyone who wants to talk about how they're feeling. Well, I'll start. Um, I'm very politically active, so I'm signing, you know, 30 to 40 petitions on animal activism. And for me, if I can't be a uh, out there, or, you know, doing, uh, I do some protests, but you know, I'm a little concerned with the way they're treating protesters. So I think that right now we have a a way to be of a a, a better uh, prominence is via email, via groups, um, you know, voting every day. 
getting involved in reading more, you know, looking at advice, looking at different programs instead of just following what the media is trying to send to you. So for me right now, it feels kind of like I, everybody's feeling that we're not capable, but it only takes one person and Ronnie Kroll is that person to come forward and be that first person to say, you know, enough is enough. We need to really have conversations, not anger, not hatred. Um, we're seeing a lot of people dying at a rapid pace and, and I think that we need leadership and new leadership because this is not leadership that we're in. We're in a situation with a man who's destroying all that we've worked for, for 50, 60 years of human, humanitarian activism. How can we let that go backwards? So I guess I'm here because I'm tired of it. I am tired of hearing and embarrassed for our country. You know, whenever I see someone from another country, I'm embarrassed. I actually apologize because this is not how we treat people and this is not how we should be. We're going backwards and we need to go forward. Snap. Snap. Listen, oh, Legally Blonde snap. is one of my favorite movies, <laughs> and Elle Woods is my spirit animal, so <laughs> listen, I've had to contend with that my entire life. <laughs> Thank you for sharing You're that. You're welcome. I'll share some things that are on my mind. All right. <laughs> okay. So, I think what's most frustrating right now is that the Electoral College was, our votes were built on a population that existed when they first created the Electoral College. Our populations have grown tremendously since then. California has way more people. So I'm upset that our votes are not reflective of what the people actually want. Um, I'm upset that we don't respect humanity, which is why we're dividing ourselves into Black Lives Matter and All Lives Matter. Like, respect human life when we don't have to say that. So I'm, I'm frustrated with that. I'm frustrated with um, the lack of how easily it is to pull the trigger and kill somebody with a gun. I'm upset about gun laws, clearly. Um, there's just overall, we're just desensitized and we are dying, we're going to prison, we are not happy, most of us are unhappy. We are living paycheck to paycheck. Humanity is not happy, that's a problem. So that's why I'm here. I love that. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's a good reason. Um, I guess I have a different perspective on life. I'm a more of a look on the brighter side of things, and I do understand there's a lot of issues this country does need to work on, but I feel in my perspective, the only way we can fix that is to fix the issues that we have right now within ourselves. Um, just because I grew up in Mississippi and I understand I understand Trump supporters just because a lot of my friends were a lot of people who supported me growing up are Trump supporters and it's just a different perspective on things and I think a lot of people don't understand that side and I guess what I'm here for is to have that balance and try to um, understand both sides of things and come to an, I guess an agreement or in a way where you can understand where other people are coming from because in the end like more hatred just feels hatred and in, in the end what we're trying to do is try to show compassion and be understanding and realize like the environment we grew up in does affect how we think and how our mindsets are so in a way you cannot blame those who do support him because if you saw the way we grew up then you can understand why and then just being able to understand just listen to someone can make a huge difference instead of immediately opposing to someone's view if that makes it's all about that. I'm, I'm here to listen. Yeah. To anything, so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and thank you for bringing that up because this meeting and this party, make no mistake, this is not a bashing of Trump party. This is not a just resist party. This is a party that's coming up with healing and solutions and finding ways to talk with people that we may from the onset disagree with. Think about it in our micro everyday lives with our friends and our family or you know, people we do business with, you're gonna have disagreements. But if every time we had a disagreement and just threw up our hands or got angry and just cut each other out, like nothing would ever get done. And we are not red states. We are not blue states. We are the United States of America. 
the United States of America. And I feel like this has been lost on us somewhere. Like, where did we start doing this that we just see red and blue? You know, where did we divide ourselves so much to where we can't see another's perspective and find reasonable compromise? The art of compromise is saying, I see what you're coming from and I see what you're saying, but here's some facts that I'm bringing to the table. Can you at least validate these and take a look at them and let's keep this dialogue open before we go burning down the bridges? So this environment that we're creating from here on out moving forward, it is one of healing, it is one of uniting, it is one of listening. Listening, because I have a lot of friends in rural America. I have friends in the South. They voted for Trump because he was one of the first candidates to actually listen to them. And when it comes to the Electoral College, it still is in place for a reason. And I'm battling trying to figure out what the right way is to go about it. But the first, if you say getting rid of the Electoral College to someone who lives in one of those states that it actually protects, um, they get very upset because imagine if big cities dictated everything and, you, and the politicians only had to go to LA and New York and Chicago and places where of high density uh, urban areas and those people would just kind of get forgotten about. That's kind of why the Electoral College still has some functionality today, and it's something that we still have to kind of explore. But the thing that we can't do is make villains out of one another. And I say that because one of the sayings that I was told was when you point at someone, there's three fingers pointing back at you. And one of the things we need to do is take ownership. And Eddie and I have a good friend named Steph, mm -hmm. who we met a few years ago, um, who is just a powerhouse individual and so energetic. And she was great to have on our team because she was about finding solutions. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're about finding blame, right? Mm -hmm. We're about who's blame, who can we point fingers at, who's gonna be the scapegoat. And while we're busy arguing and fighting and placing blame, the American people are falling through the cracks. It's like being in the middle of a divorce. Divorces are hard. It's like, do we go with mommy or do we go with daddy? You know, or mommy or mommy or daddy or daddy or whatever that is. Uh, but it's like, we the people are falling through the cracks while the major parties are arguing and playing politically divisive games. Now, there are good Republicans and good Democrats that set out on the journey to make a difference. And they are making a difference every single day. But the machines themselves are what we need to address, why they're not functioning properly, and why a third machine would actually benefit us. You know, a strong third machine would benefit us. One thing that I've been thinking about since we've been sitting here talking is that the need of educating citizens mm -hmm. is really important. Because as we're sitting here talking, like we're, talk we're talking about the things that polarize us, but I think that people, especially in rural areas, mm -hmm. don't realize how their vote is actually hurting them because they're not educated on what the real issues are. And so in order to have a third party be impactful, impactful and viable on all of those things, we need to educate mm -hmm. the That's population right. about the issues. That's right. That's right. Well, and go ahead. I, I, you know what's been very interesting about this entire thing? As Ronnie knows, I have never been politically involved in anything. In the days when I had a partner, he makes the decisions. When it's time to vote, I literally, and I know so many people around the world do this. Mm -hmm. You go to your partner and say, okay, what do I need to vote? Mm -hmm. I'm a Democrat because he's a Democrat. I vote because he picked the topics. Okay, mark this one, mark. And we've been doing that since I was a child. Mm -hmm. And now at 24 years old, <coughs> um, <laughs> in dog years, uh, it's just the idea that this is what I was taught. This is right. how you do it. Right. So when Bernie Sanders, before Trump was elected president, was Bernie, Hillary, and all that stuff going on, I decided to get involved in politics. I ask questions. I have never been treated so horribly by people from the Clinton group and the Trump group because I like Bernie. When I asked a question, I was tore up defriended, threatened, mm -hmm. called names. That's just not me, that's everybody, because this is what we do. We're either Clinton or we're Trump. Hence, I think the importance of this party, because it's finally time 
to get up off our ass and do something instead of bitching. I go to a party, we're talking to people, everybody's complaining about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Give them an opportunity to step to the front of the line. Oops, sorry, I can't do it. Yeah. Okay, that's because it's the conditioning that we've been given. Now's an opportunity not to fight, mm -hmm. not to create war, but to, like you said, educate. educate. It's time to educate. When I ask somebody a question, it's turned around that I don't like that candidate. I'm like, I never said that. I asked you a question. Right. I don't know about politics. Teach me. Mm -hmm. So people like me normally tuck tail and run. And basically, that's what I did. Yeah. I backed off and I'm like, I'm not doing this. I told him, I'm not doing this. This mm -hmm. is ridiculous. I have never seen such deplorable behavior by mm -hmm. people that I've known for years. I got into fights with people that I that I grew up with. That you love. And I love them to death. And I'm like, I don't want to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. That is the kind of place we're at. Mm -hmm. When we can't have a conversation, we turn away. Mm -hmm. And the ones with the biggest mouths are the ones that get to stay out there because everybody that has a valid point or needs to learn walks away because they just don't want to be a part of that. So. I think it's important what Ronnie's doing here. I think this is very important because for the first time, we're gonna have a platform to come together, to educate, to learn, to do the things that I think we need to really start doing, which is make the USA the place it's supposed to be. It's what I grew up, this was supposed to be the prime place. This was everything in the world. So it's, it's nice to see at my age that I can be a part of something like this. Well, and I'm glad you guys brought up education and you talked about how the 2016 election actually ruined so many friendships and relationships. So 10, 15, 20, 30 year relationships just gone, gone by the wayside because of uh, an argument uh, about two political figures that have more money than God, that have power, regardless if they win the election or not. They go on and live their lives and it's destroyed ours. Why? You know, why? You know, you've shared birthdays and weddings and deaths and, and, and everything together for 30 years and all of a sudden it's gone. Well, uh, one, one thing I do want to say, sorry about that, that's okay. um, is that there is a long process to everything. Mm -hmm. So it's not happening overnight. It started a long time ago and it is there. It's scary. People have fear. People are fearing of losing their jobs, fear of losing their homes because they're afraid to just step outside of the box and, and really say what they feel. Mm -hmm. People are in fear, people are separated, we're divided, we're fighting with our families because it's scary, you know? Mm -hmm. People are dying over this. Well, people died for laws to change in humanity. People died for, you know, we. there's going to be bloodshed. I, I have this uh, thing given to me, actually a bracelet someone gave to me and I picked it out of a box and it said bleed. And to me, we're all gonna bleed in some way, whether it be in death, whether it be, you know, we're bleeding because we're women, you know, we're bleeding somehow to make change in this world. And it's not gonna happen overnight, but this is exciting because this is the seed to start the conversation. I've tried to have that meet in the middle conversation with um, other parties and it doesn't happen. I saw my ballot go into a black box. I voted for Bernie, went into a black box that never got scanned. So I know that the voting is all jacked up you know, the fact that we have no way of really telling even the lady who developed the new system to ve do a whole voting system with the paper and the sheet was hacked within a day. Think about that, you know? So we're in a really high time of scary change, but I'm excited because, like I said, it only takes one person and another person to believe. And I think if you have that belief that things can change, things will start to change. Mm -hmm. You can't sit around and say, oh, you know, I'm a red so you're, oh, you don't know, okay, you know what? Maybe I can't have this conversation with you right now. Um, I have a lot of Trump, you know, fans, you know, I'm not gonna not be their friend, but I've been dumped because I'm I, not, you know, I make jokes, mm -hmm. I joke around, you know, I can't help it. He's just everywhere, he's everywhere, Trump's everywhere. So I have to make jokes to make light of what I'm seeing every day, the murders of the animals, the things happening to animals right now is just so beyond me. I mean, I could literally tell you that it's embarrassing to even want to talk about it, but it's disgusting. I have to look at this every day. So, you know, I think we're at a heightened place where people's tensions are so high that we think we can't change it, but it will change. Mm. It will change. Well, it, it's, it's got to change. I mean, I look at, during the election, one of the, I think the hardest things for you and I to really look at was being a man, you know, that's gay. Mm -hmm. 
I grew up in an area where walking down the streets with your partner was not acceptable. You know, you got to, took a chance getting beat up. Prior to me, I think it was Stonewall, is that the one? Okay, you've got those issues. There was a huge issue in New Orleans back in the 70s where hundreds of people were murdered. Um, so we've come such a long way, and when we had mutual friends walking down the boulevard that were beaten to a pulp by other members of the gay community wow. was way over the top. Yeah, that's when it to start oh, destruction yeah. within our own community, we were supposed to be banding together and we were fighting amongst each other over two bodies. I get it, I understand it's important, but when it comes to us tearing each other apart over something like that, mm -hmm. I was disgusted. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. And I'm like, this is all gonna change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Randy? So for me, since I've been a child, I've never understood our political process in not taking care of our own. Mm -hmm. In the process of saying that America is the best when we have hungry, homeless, illiterate people that should not be happening at all. And the wealth is not divided. It's not, I mean, it, most, it has to almost become a socialist issue because we need to develop some way, like the young lady that won in New York or New Jersey, that she wants to make sure that education is free mm -hmm. for the people that qualify for that. There's no reason we can't do these things. It's all, it's all uh, comes down to the dollar mm -hmm. because everybody is so motivated that if they don't make money, they're not looking at it, just like our drugs. Yeah. Insane, insane that HIV drugs are $5,000, $6,000 a month when they cost $50 a month. It, I mean, it's just, it's just a little crazy that we're so out of whack. And I, I've always said this, this is why, um, you know, I, I don't really support the government extremely. Um, I only got political when I stood up when Linda LaRouche reared his ugly head and wanted to put all the gays in concentration camps and went to the Wiltern Theater and got the Wiltern Theater to give me the theater and I raised $24,000 to open the doors to start fighting him because it was, it was similar to what's happening now that if you don't speak up, this is the way Hitler became yeah. Hitler. And everything becomes normalized. Right, and, and, and if you really look at the pattern, this is a very Hitler-like pattern. And it's, I'm not bashing Trump, it's not Trump's fault. Mm -hmm. It's our fault for allowing this to happen because people didn't think, that's why people didn't vote. They said he'll never make it, it won't happen. And as we sat there that night, and every every time we lost another state, it was it was devastating. It was it was an evening that was unbelievable in history to watch go down. And and I think we really need to step away from what's normal in the political party and create something that is nurturing because we aren't. Yeah. Well, we don't have a nurturing. We don't have a government that really takes care of the people at all now. And everything is being taken away day by day. day, by day. We watch what we fought for 60 years to build mm -hmm. and watching it being taken away from us. And we can't, and there's nothing, we can stand up and be heard, but because the money is so big and overpowering, it's hard for us to stop it. Well, now you hit it right on the head because there's the old saying of following the money. It all comes right. down to money. Right. And on our dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. It really should say, in money we trust. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> Come on. I mean, because it really comes down to, and listen, I'm not bashing capitalism. I think capitalism to this day is still the best method of governance and moving forward for a system but that doesn't mean that you can't have mixed markets within that system. You can't, we already have socialistic ideas, right? Like anyone who uses the roads is using government funds that we've all pooled together to use right. the roads and highways and infrastructure and things of that nature. And you're right, it, it's, it's more about how we're allocating these funds, you know? Well, like, our middle class is being taken away. Totally, I mean, totally. It's, 
it's now either going to be you're going to be in the lower class or you're going to be in the elite. Yeah. And that and that's what's happening, and that's what they want. Mm -hmm. You know that you're going to beat the dog while it's down and just get it further further in the ground, and the, and then other people just keep on making more money. And the middle America is disappearing, and middle America didn't realize they've lost they because basically because they really weren't educated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if they were really educated and really understood everything, not de I'm not even saying Democratic or Republican. If the Republicans really stood up for what's right for the country, then this would be this would not be such a big issue. But the Republicans won't even stand up mm -hmm. against what's going on, well, which is very sad. But I think it's all of Congress. It's not just the Republicans. No, it's it's, right. it's our it's our it's our government system right now that's really a foul. Well, and that's happened, again, I feel like because of the two-party system. And our founding fathers, two things, would be rolling over in their grave if they thought that you could go into a lifelong career of politics. And to be stay in Congress. And, and just stay there down. forever never and live high off the hog on, 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 on <laughs> the fruits of the labors of others. You were supposed to go into office and you were the nurse, you were the doctor, the lawyer, the clerk, the you know, teacher, and you served your time, and then you were to go out. You weren't supposed to be there. When I lobbied for education funds back in 2003, I was at part of an education summit in DC, and I was on behalf of Harper College, and I remember meeting with a congressperson at the time, and he must have been there for at least 20 years, and his aides were doing all the work. Like, he didn't know anything about the issues, he had no idea about what he was talking about, but the aides were whispering in his ear, like, this is what you need to say, this is how you should respond. And listen, it, that's a double-edged sword too, because length of leadership is good for stability. Like, once you get something going, you kind of want to have that going. But how much is too much, you know? And we can talk about term limits and how we feel as a party and things of that nature. Um, but the money in politics, and it's almost as if the Democrats and Republicans agree on one thing, and that's keeping out third party potential viable candidates that have a better idea, yeah. that have a better way, that could actually go up against them in a debate and they wouldn't know what to say because they've gotten so used to, I'm not the other guy or gal, mm -hmm. vote for me. Mm -hmm. If you think about business, right? Let's think about business and our cell phones. You know, you've got AT&T and you've got Verizon and Sprint and T-Mobile and you're all getting free branding. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, Metro PCS. Uh, but you have all these options. And in America, we don't like monopolies. They happen sometimes, but we don't like them. So much so that we have anti-monopoly laws on the books. So you have all these options as a consumer for two reasons. One, because it keeps prices affordable and reasonable, and it improves the quality of the product. It forces these companies not to throw out a half-ass product and say, here, paint some gold on it and it's fine. So why is that not true of our politics? Why do we constantly hear people saying, I'm choosing the lesser of two evils? You know, Why is it true that we're only seeing the Democrats and Republicans on the world stage when you do have other really great minds that need to be heard. Well, I think the other thing is, I, I think it's disgusting that the money that's spent on campaigning, yeah. instead of why not, why not make them have their merits and actually learn how to speak and actually talk the truth instead of bashing other people? Right. Why are we doing this through a negative force instead of not coming up with, here's why you vote for me? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, why do we have to throw dirt at each other? I don't, I just, I, it's something that I've always disagreed with. I don't, I think it's, it's not productive. It doesn't help our children what, by, whatsoever because it's not teaching our children anything great. It's showing that you, know, you, can, be, you can win by being really ruthless and, and making up, sometimes even making up stories, but they, it's too late, it's already been put out there and it's damaging even though it might not be true and really turn this around where we, where we absolutely cap it off. They can't spend this type of money. Yeah. The money that's spent in, in, in politics is just 
totally disgusting. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much the 2016 election cost? Well, yeah, I, I can't even fathom. All across the board, all the candidates and all the money that was spent, five billion dollars. Mm -hmm. What well, doesn't surprise me? Five billion. Yeah, doesn't surprise me at yeah. all. Five billion. And we bailed out Wall Street, right, in 2008 because of all the bad subprime loans that were given. And literally people, like good, hardworking, tax-paying people, put their money into these uh, retirement money market accounts that then invested into these other accounts that were knowingly giving subprime loans, They're giving all, these mo all this money away to people they knew weren't going to be able to pay it to make their money at the top. And this is why we had this big crash in the financial market. And then all of a sudden the taxpayers had to come in and wave their magic wand and give them $700 billion to bail them out. Yet we can't find ways to bail out Wall Street or fund basic health care or education and things right. that are actually investments in the people. So I don't know if you know, but after the towers fell in 2001, so in 2003 I joined a mortgage company and I started seeing these loans, these you know deferment loans where they just pay the money of the rent, uh, you know, like the interest first, and then oh you'll be fine. You know, all the middle class signed up for homes and mortgages. So I wasn't selling those loans, I refused to sell the negative amortization loans at that time, and that was 2003. And I was still making money and working for the mortgage company, but I refused those loans. And everybody else was selling them because I just felt wrong about it. Mm -hmm. So I ended up having to leave because my father had passed away, and I quit that job, and I saw it one by one, one by one. I kept telling people, don't buy that condo. Don't buy that. You don't have enough money. Do you have 40000 in the bank? You don't have 40000 in the bank. You're taking this loan and it's going to increase twice as much. Uh, hear me out. Nobody would listen. So people lost their homes. So it was happening earlier. So if we can go back to 2001, we're talking about a stock market and the, and the process is much longer. You know, we all know this. We're not, we're not uneducated about it. You know, we're, we're all Americans. We can see it. You just don't want to believe that this is what our, our government's doing right now. So they're just taking our money and spending it ridiculously. But again, money is power, power is money. How do we, how do we combat that? By laws, you know, by making sure we get the right judges in there. Now we've got all these judges, you know, it's getting kind of nerve wracking. How are we gonna get these judges out? How are we gonna change the laws? It's a little overwhelming. So as I was coming into this, I think it's exciting that we're moving forward to, uh, to start this new People's Party because it is about we the people. Mm -hmm. We are all involved. We all are here in America because of our ancestors, because of people who have been brought here. We're all immigrants, all of us, mm -hmm. you know? So I'm excited. I'm, I just want to say that with everything being said, I know we can't do it overnight. But this is the beginning. It's the beginning, and I'm 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 scared and I'm excited. I just want to say it. I have mixed emotions. I'm happy that you guys are here because I didn't want to feel alone. Like my hair is coming. <laughs> so you know, I'm making a big stance, and I really don't care. I'm not worried about the past or what will happen. I'm more concerned about how can I start making change now because I'm only going to be here another forty some odd years. You know, maybe at best, knock on wood. You know, eighty five. And I just want to make a difference. And I think that all of you, and you are all courageous being here. And thank you. I'm excited. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I, I believe a change starts with society itself. It's the, pers like, growing in Mississippi, I thought my life was meant to be. You go to school, you go to work, you have a family. And that, that was happiness. That was the American dream. But growing up in such a small town and in such a bubble, and getting outside that bubble. I lived in different countries and I seen the worst and we as Americans, I think, are complacent in life yeah. and comfortable. So we don't understand or realize what life could be like outside of this bubble, just like I didn't. And I think that is the issue at hand is that a lot of people are comfortable, complacent. They just see what they see on the media and believe it because it's, you know, it's on there. They and But they don't, they don't put themselves in that position to fully experience what it is like to be on the other side of things. And moving out here, it is a lot more liberating. I have a lot more 
openness out here that I, that I never had in Mississippi. So right. it, it affects me and my life. And I think if people had more opportunities to be more open, to have more freedom, like people do here, then I think that would make such a huge difference. And then that starts with education, and that starts with like, you know, the young kids, if they had more options to be creative, they had more options, like, you know, if only, if they, if they, if it was acceptable to have like a mom and a mom together, instead of getting picked on and bullied on, because mm -hmm. growing up for me, I did get bullied because of my color, and my parents did have it harder, but in the end, like, you know, we chose the like, you know, the high, the high road, and didn't like, you know, go against it we just accepted it and realized you know we can make a change we can make a difference and that just starts by like realizing what the issue is and learning how to handle and react to them instead of you know complaining about mm -hmm. it or like you know like I know kids who do get bullied in school instead of like you know having mommy and daddy protect them they need to teach these kids how to like value themselves and like defend themselves in situations because in the end we have so much hate in this world you know, we can't fight hate by going against it. We should fight hate by showing compassion towards people. And I think in my in my culture, it's like, that's why you don't see Asians fighting as hard, and it's because we're silently fighting and trying to grow our own like lives in order to better ourselves first, instead of worrying about what other people thought of us. And I think in the end, that's that's how it should be. Like, you should vote, like, you should be able to inspire and encourage people to find their own happiness within so they can make their own decision instead of trying to influence them your way because no nobody's way is the right way you know um, in the end it's it's all about respect and I, I feel like if people learn to respect each other then we can learn to grow together and I feel I feel we can do that yes yeah. respect to I just want to snap through your entire talk respect to each other yeah. Aretha R E S B C T exactly <laughs> No, I mean, it's, you can't, it's like Dr. King said, you can't drive out darkness with more darkness, mm -hmm. and we have to be the light, and I think being the light is also realizing that there is ne not necessarily just one right way, like, I don't have to make you wrong to be right, right. Mm -hmm. I can come to the table and debate a different idea or approach based on my factual information and my opinions and you can do the same and then we put our heads together mm -hmm. and this is where my frustration comes with the major parties is that's their job yeah. they're getting paid one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year plus benefits and everything to go to work and knock on each other's door and text and email and find ways to, to figure out that compromise and you know I'm so glad that we are all here and the ways that we've all come to be but two of you have been via yeah, lift, right? right. Yeah. So I am a lift driver yeah. part-time <laughs> and I met Morgan in my lift. And I said we're the adults and, and you turned around and, I and said, raised your hand. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was leaving an event and you were my lift driver. <laughs> and lift is bringing people together, let me tell you. <laughs> um, I went to a Black Lives Matters meeting this week and I was scared a little bit, you know, just because it's out of my comfort zone. It's not something that I would normally do. It's different. I didn't know what to expect. I knew of what Black Lives Matter was. I've been paying attention to their progress and everything that they stand for. But it's a whole other thing to actually leave your room and go and just show up. And I went with one of my new friends, also from Lyft. Her name is Yoshi, and she is Native American. And she attended with me. And we went together, and it was very well attended. It was probably about 40 people strong. And uh, you know what I learned from talking to my friend Yoshi and, and, the, and the folks at the Black Lives Matter? My, jo my job as a white male and, and a privilege, white privilege as they say, uh, and white privilege is something that, you know, a lot of people, especially white men, have a knee-jerk reaction to because automatically the defense mechanisms go up. You don't want to hear it, you think it's an insult, you think it's offensive. Um, but I had to learn that my place is not to go to bat for any one minority. I may be white privileged, but I'm also gay, right? So I've been other my entire life. So I know what it feels like to live with 
shame of being different, being ostracized, being treated differently. Mm -hmm. And so it was such an interesting dichotomy because here I am with all this privilege being a white man, but then I have this gayness that's also a part of me. And granted, I can hide my gayness, I can't hide the color of my skin, mm -hmm. but what I had to learn from Yoshi on our way over to the Black Lives meeting, she said, you know, you know, people get upset and wonder why we get so frustrated when they use the Native American Indian with the headdress as a mascot for teams, but they have no idea how much work goes into earning every single one of those feathers on the headdress. Like, we put our community and our tribes through work and they have to earn merits. That to, and every chief that you see wearing one of those headdresses, and then you see people going out and dressing up as Indians and making them a mascot, like how offensive and how rude that is to the Native American culture and how we don't educate in our curriculum in, in schools like about the different mm -hmm. tribes and what they're about and that they're just like any other tribe, you know, that are, you know, living their lives and have traditions and cultures. And um, But the thing that I learned that was paramount for me was as a white man who does have privilege, my privilege gives me power. It gives me power to assemble a group meeting like this, to stream it live and to have a certain amount of clout, if you will, within the community to where people will listen. But my job is not to speak for a black person or a Native American person or an Asian person because that struggle is yours. Mm -hmm. That's not my struggle. My job is just to help build the platform that has credibility and then gives people the ability to hopefully hear you with respect. And I think that's what this boils down to, too, is we all have struggle. We all have pain. You shared Ebony Davis's post the other day, which I just thought was so spot on. Ebony Davis said, you know, it never really occurred to me that the reason why we're not moving forward in our individual lives or even as a culture, is because we're so set and focused on our trauma. Mm -hmm. We've been through a lot. I mean, this country is an amazing country, but you have to think about our history. Mm -hmm. You know, we've stolen lands from Native Americans. We, we enslaved an entire group of people in black people. We created separate but equal, but not really equal. And then we just tell people to pick themselves up by the bootstraps as if nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. And that there was no, that that inequality doesn't have a lasting effect generation after generation. That that lasting trauma, think about anything sitting here today from your childhood that you know is one of your deepest, darkest demons that haunts you. Just when things are going well and everything's going great, all of a sudden that demon pops up. And that, especially at night, that voice goes off. And it tells you you're not worth it. You can't do it. It's not possible. You don't deserve it. They're all going to laugh at you. What are they going to think? We have these traumas that we need to work through, and instead of judging each other's traumas or trying to gauge whose struggle is the biggest, we just have to acknowledge each other's struggle. I think in order to move forward as an American people, we gotta stop this radical hatred that these parties, these, this, this two-party duopoly is uh, mm -hmm. propagating. Because it's, the system itself is tearing us apart at the seams. It doesn't provide for us to connect and see value in our diversity, to see our diversity as an asset, because we're constantly mudslinging and there's always an enemy to be made. But newsflash, while we're at each other's throats arguing and throwing mud publicly, and we've got the news hyped up on steroids, whether you're watching CNN or Fox, you know, they're getting paid. These producers of these shows, these networks are making money hand over fist. And I love the media. I'm not like Donald Trump. <laughs> I do love the media. However, I do think that they are part of the problem because we have to bring integrity back to the way we report the news mm -hmm. and that we don't hype it up on such steroids to where we're going out in our everyday lives and our communities. I mean, you see it here in LA. Someone cuts someone off and someone then gets out of the car and starts beating on their, like, trying to pull them out of the car to hurt them. You know that that's not just because someone cut you off. That's a bunch of pent up anger and frustration and aggression with nowhere to go, you know? So I think if we are truly going to move forward and create a new party that is going to serve the people first 
and not the corporations or the oligarchs. We need to figure out a way to get us all on a level playing field. And the only way I know how to do that is from my micro level experiences with my past relationships. Go figure. You know, I used to like be like, oh man, I had to kiss a lot of frogs to get to a prince. But it's all those relationships that teach you that in our lives we are the hero, we're the villain, we're the mentor, and it ebbs and flows, and sometimes we're toxic for other people, and sometimes they're toxic for us. Mm -hmm. And so it's about realizing that we as human beings and as American citizens, we all have light and dark parts. And in order to have empathy for other people's light and dark parts, you have to be able to accept yourself first. Mm -hmm. Because hurt people hurt people, and they project this negativity outward and outward and outward and outward, and it's a vicious, nasty cycle. So how do we look with a very clear lens at our country's history? How do we acknowledge the highs and lows and everything in between, make peace with it, give people the, the, the room to share their story and to heal and feel heard? And then how do we level the playing field that it's just every American in this country deserves X, Y, and Z moving forward? Because, again, going back to that narrative loop that we get stuck in, we got to break that narrative. Mm -hmm. We need to be the hero of our individual stories and we need to be the hero of our country's story. The world is counting on us. So instead of replaying over and over and over again the tragedies of our country and the mistakes of our country purely just to drive it into the ground and dig a deeper hole, we have to talk about it honestly and with respect mm -hmm. so that everyone feels heard so that, that we can heal and then stop scratching the scab because what happens with a scab when you keep scratching at it it opens up again and it never heals mm -hmm. so I guess that's one of my questions that I pose to this group and to everyone watching as we grow how do we figure out how to do that how do we get those conversations to ha happen and trust me I know there's people that are unreachable you know, because they're just so far off the deep end and they're not thinking rationally that, and, and, and they're just, you're never gonna reach them. But I think that more people are reachable than not. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of times politicians uh, underestimate the American people. I think we're a lot smarter mm -hmm. than, you know, they give us credit for. And they've also pushed the buttons. They've, they've placed those buttons within us. And I know that there's a lot of party loyalty, loyalists watching and that's okay. But when we, you know, when we follow blindly, and that's whatever person or party that is, without asking questions, again, that pointing fingers of blame, you gotta ask yourself, well, why didn't I ask more questions? Why didn't I dig a little deeper? Why didn't I get more involved rather than sitting on the sidelines? I think our country is at a dynamic time in our history. I think if we pay attention to our history and we learn from our mistakes, and we find ways to meet in the middle and realize that there are, there is room for compromise for us all to thrive, that we're really onto something here. I really do feel that. So, yeah, that was a lot. I am a politician, man. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And, and um, again, I don't have all the answers, but I think just listening. You know, we have two ears and one mouth, and we need to start listening more. But I think it also, sorry, um, I think it also comes to like, we, ha we have this mentality that if someone does something wrong, it's unforgivable. And as humans, we will tend to make mistakes. And I think people need to learn that those mistakes are meant to happen in order to fix it. And we need to all learn to be honest with ourselves first. And I think a lot of the issues at hand is, um, People don't know what's right because they don't know how to be honest or truthful towards other people. So they'll say what they want to hear or they'll say what they don't want to hear. And I think when it comes to the mistakes America has made in history is learning to accept it and let go of it and learn that like, okay, in all honesty, this is not what I wanted. And at least you can say it happened for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. And I think more people need to come to accept that you know, whatever happens in America, mm -hmm. appreciate it more than hate it, you know? I, I think 
Trump was voted in for a reason, and it's in order, maybe, maybe it was for us to awaken. For us to be awakened and come mm -hmm. together, you know, you, you know, you can't, you can't be good without having a bad, like, you know, problem to resolve. You can't have a solution without a problem. Of course. And I think people and see it as more like a problem, problem instead of like a, it's a problem for us to resolve. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a challenge that we need to face, but you know, we can do it. Like, it's not impossible. Of course. And I think, I think people need to learn to appreciate it more than hate hate it and like well we definitely um, are in abundance here and, yeah. and America is the most California is the most abundant we're in the yeah. right place I'm yeah. sorry but I have to say I'm so thankful that I'm in this country being a former military mm -hmm. ex-wife and a lieutenant I, I I value everything in this country and what we've come to mm -hmm. it's not totally horrible mm -hmm. it's it's a beautiful place mm -hmm. and we just gotta be more responsible be more responsible to make it a better place. And you were gonna say something, I'm sorry. I oh, wanna, no, I wanna I, hear what it, you It's just say. interesting, because I, I hear what you guys are saying. I guess when people are dying, it's really hard to see yeah. how to be positive about it. And right. like, you know, I get scared. I, I One reason I take lifts is because I'm scared to drive, mm -hmm. because if the police pull me over, what's gonna happen to mm -hmm. me? And especially, right. I've had incidents, you know, I used to have long walks down to here, but I've had incidents where police have pulled me over thinking I'm a man when I have my hair short. So when people are dying, yeah. just because they're being who they are, that has to be seen and acknowledged right. and not like, oh, right. America's right. this great place like that we've been. Like, mm. I, because, okay, the governor of, of New York is getting trouble for this, right? Just yeah. saying like, you know, uh, when was America great? You know, what, what, were we, what were we trying to make it right. go back to right. great right. again? Like, what, what, when was America great? And I think a lot of that is because people are not looking at the true existence of people, you know, when we're talking about poverty even, right? Mm -hmm. Like, history has been written to reflect this great America that he was speaking of, mm -hmm. but the reality of the situation is it's not, it, it hasn't been great for all of us. That's right. right. So being honest about that, you can call it a mistake, but is it a mistake? Because it's always been profitable. It's a very right. profitable mm -hmm. mistake. So to say that it's a mistake, it's kind of like denouncing mm -hmm. everything, mm -hmm. the, the struggle basically, right. right? So there's a sensitivity yeah. issue there. So like we can call it a mistake and like that's, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Right. The solution, right? Because it's like a healing of pain, mm -hmm. right? So, and I hear, and I love what you said about how the Asian community, they keep to, they keep to yourself, mm -hmm. and you're about building yourself. And that's great, but that goes back to the division. We need to stop dividing. We're all human. Mm -hmm. We all shit out the same asshole, right? <laughs> so, like, <laughs> so, like, come together, and, like, let's build, and let's be great, because we haven't been great again. Mm -hmm. right? and, and, like, and, like, one of the things about the healing, like, I like that analogy. One of the things about the healing, though, is being true about what the issue is. Mm -hmm. yes. You've got to be honest about what is really happening that healing can ever take place. Mm -hmm. right. And I think because we know how horrific things can be in other places, they also are horrific here. Yeah. And we, They're just hidden. You're right. right. Mm -hmm. And under this dream. We like, can always compare great. ourselves mm -hmm. to something less than or, or yeah. someone who's more poor than us. Mm -hmm. But like, why? When we're already, we're building. Let's mm -hmm. keep going. Mm -hmm. Let's shoot for the top. There's no reason to compare ourselves. The poverty in India is terrible. Mm -hmm. But we don't need to compare ourselves to that, right? Because then it's like, oh, we're so privileged. Yeah, but like, come on, let's keep going. We're also a very young country. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we're, we're, we are figuring out our mistakes, mm -hmm. you know? We are finding ways to, to, to move on. So wow. I'm here for it. But, but the only thing I want is that I think we have to be true about what is really happening. Do not that's ignore. In, yeah, that, right. That's re what's really mm -hmm. happening, you know, I heard a statistic and I'm gonna mess it up. But basically, if we took a portion of the of the money that we put into the prison system, we could cure hunger in America. But we don't want to do that. Yeah. Why? Because, right, because we want to make money. Make money. Mm. The mistakes make money. Yeah. Well, so it goes. Humans are no longer. Well, and I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually watching um, Harry Alford, who's the head of the National Black Chamber of Commerce, the other day. He was being interviewed. And I was fascinated because I genuinely just wanted to get his perspective on things and how he felt about black ownership of enterprise and how were they thriving and was he happy with that and for the most part he was but he also was asked the question about uh, the pipeline the oil pipeline that was so controversial uh, and was going to taint water and stuff like that but he was actually for the pipeline and I was like trying to figure out why but then it came out He's like, well, you know, me and my family are sitting on, you know, oil on our property and stuff like wow. that. 
and he kind of agreed with Trump and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to me that it always just comes back to money, and it's not yeah. even so much all the other divisions. Yeah. It's not the sexual orientation. It's not the color. That's distraction. Yes, yeah. that's, that's to divide us, you guys. All and while we're us. busy bickering and, and, and hating on each other, they're up there like, <laughs> yeah. and let's, let's, it's like Smithers yeah. from like uh, Smithers. it's like Smithers from what The is, Simpsons. One thing that I wanted to say earlier too is like drilling down on the issues because a lot of times we focus on abortion or you know these uh these quick, topics. these quick topics that get people really riled up emotionally but there are so many things that are being rolled back right now that people don't like i learned that, like they're not covering it on the news you know somebody who's more educated and tactical than me usually ends up telling me and i go do research and i have no idea yeah. the type of rollback the small things that yeah. are being rolled back to make Rich people stay rich. Yes. And that's what it's all about. They distract us with abortion. They distract us with the They distract us with infidelities. They distract <laughs> us with the next. Every day. Every day. And you want to know why? And forgive me for saying this. I, again, I love the media. But those media anchors are, are making, making money. money. Yes. yes. Well, the, the and we're writing rumors sometimes, too. Yes. Just like... The 24-hour news cycle was actually very, well, very harmful because you had to keep... Yeah revenue coming in for the 24-hour news right. cycle. Right. And so, I think the, oh yeah. No, 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 <laughs> no, this is really good because, you know, we need the passion and we need to also, as you said, find the balance mm -hmm. between people being murdered mm -hmm. right. and people being murdered in Syria. There is no difference. Mm -hmm. It's just happening faster and more targeted mm -hmm. and quicker. Mm -hmm. Over and here, more talked about. More mm -hmm. talked about. Yeah. Here, it's been going on for mm -hmm. decades. Mm -hmm you know, decades of people being murdered and genocide. You put all that number together and it's as much as Syria has been hidden mm -hmm. that small amount of time. The only thing I say that I say, yes, I do love America because how fierce and hardworking we are to yeah. make that change, yeah. to make it better. Yes, we are way more privileged. We have water. We have everything at our fingertips. Some of us, honey, some of us. Wait, 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 you went through Mississippi, I went through Mississippi. I, w I didn't get, uh, I went to a restaurant and they wouldn't serve me. I'm an other, mm -hmm. you know. I understand, but it made me realize, now I understand. Mm -hmm. Now I have more compassion, but I found that compassion at 21, mm -hmm. at 16, knowing that this is what they're dealing with on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So I was able to love everybody a much better place because I did travel, right? Mm -hmm. You go across the United States, you go out of country, you see the, the situation with Mexico and the water, and you're like, never will I live here. Even though I am Latin, partially, I don't want to live in Mexico. It's a third world country and it's scary. And they have a thousand homicides in a, in a six I'm months. with Mexico though. Like, yeah. like, no, 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 hold on, hold on, just okay. <laughs> So a thousand homicides in one little area of Tijuana, right, and all the cartel and everything, it's a beautiful place. I can go to Mexico because I speak the language, right, and I can go through there and I feel somewhat comfortable, but I'm still looked at as a weta. They must call me weta all day long, you know? It's different. So when you go to different countries, the treatment you get, even when I was in Ireland, I had to say I was from Spain, or I was there and to call me a Yankee all day. So, you know, you've got the different perspectives in different countries and what they think of us. Yeah. Spain thinks that we're a bunch of fat people eating McDonald's, mm -hmm. literally. Wait a minute. So I said to him, I'm sorry, I'm on this train. I'm probably the 10% with a passport, right? Mm -hmm. I'm here. Do you, are you a bullfighter? <laughs> He's all, what? Are you a bullfighter? No. Well, that's all Americans see of Spain. Mm -hmm. Or they see the cathedral, or they see whatever. So again, Every country has its mm. its toll, mm. but the suffering of genocide, the recognition of people constantly being killed and murdered. We have the highest rate of Californians being killed and murdered by cops in all of the United States. Well, and I want to. Sp I'm glad this is being brought up a little bit, and we could talk about this for, for days. hours. Let's, days up. Up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just yeah. So I just want to say she's right. They're right in recognizing that, and they're also right in finding a new conversation of being positive and finding the balance, and um, and trying to 
Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, I want it to be a cool place. <laughs> I'll see you in the middle. Right. <laughs> and it can be nerdy, quirky, cute. But <laughs> nothing but love. Nothing but love nothing because love. it's like, there's going to be high tension when of we course. talk about the tough talks, yeah. right? Anytime I've gone through any leadership seminar or participated in any program I've been involved with, there have been moments, but we've always set up the space as a safe space. Things are going to get heated. People are going to have knee-jerk reactions. There's going to be triggers. And when that happens, we have to find a way to de-escalate mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. till we get to what's underneath mm -hmm. it. It's almost like when we treat, you know, uh, ailments with just drugs to, to numb it, but we never really get down to, to where right. the pain really mm -hmm. is. We self-medicate a lot in this country mm -hmm. because we don't want to feel. Right. We don't, what do we talk about when we get together for the holidays? Oh, we don't talk about religion or politics. You know how your father is. You know how your grandma is. And she's only got a few more years. So let's just keep it happy. You know, it's like. Grazing over. It's we've done a disservice. Yeah. We've yeah. done a disservice in our country to our country and its people by saying sweep it under the rug and let's not talk about it. Yeah. Because we don't know how to have the tough talks healthfully, effectively, right. to where we listen and mm -hmm. respond, and even if at the end of that conversation, and mom, I know mom's listening right now, <laughs> she and I have agreed to disagree on a lot of things. <laughs> we have an adult relationship now, and we're gonna spar, and we're gonna butt heads, but we love each other so much, and we care about the relationship more than our ego or being right, so we leave it alone, and we say, okay, agree to disagree, cool. Yeah. Two weeks from now, maybe she or I come back to the table with some new information. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know, we agree to disagree. Can I cross up this bridge and have you take a look at that? Oh, mm -hmm. I, I never saw it that way. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. But it leaves that room mm -hmm. to grow mm -hmm. and learn together. Um, I want to just shout out to Stephen uh, Cooper who says that empathy is key. Empathy is always the yes. key. Yes. And uh, my mom actually posed a question. She says... Uh, does the current generation understand what it means to be a part of the melting pot? They do. They do, but they don't. I, I, I feel a lot of people don't know what it's like outside of America just because they don't know if that's an option. And I think, I think now it's getting a little bit um, better because kids are traveling more. People are getting more cultured. But then again, we have like, you know, people are getting cultured and child for the wrong reasons to make their Instagram look great or like, mm -hmm. you know, they're doing it for the, you know, the social media, but, you know, in all aspects, people should have that opportunity. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be afraid to go out and travel just because they hear something on the news or they think it's too expensive because in, in a way, people need, people need to learn how to get out of their comfort zone in order to learn and, and be happy doing it because I, I know... I know for me, a lot of my friends are still stuck in Mississippi because they're too afraid right. to get out, and they don't. And it's because, you know, they grew up in a sense watching the news, watching me, and thinking that the perfect life is to have a job, is to go to college, is to like have a family. And I know for a fact that most kids, if you don't go to college, then you're already frowned upon, or you're just, you know, having a little bit harder. And the, and I think kids, they shouldn't have to be scared to like they you know people go to college and they don't know what to what, what, what they want to do with themselves and they even when they graduate it's still left laws and I think society we need to be able to become accepting that like hey if you don't want to go to college that's okay hey if you need to figure out what you want to do go out there and put yourself out there and I think a lot of times we're restricted or we're judged or you know because I'm single and not married it's like a bad it's a bad thing it shouldn't have to be a bad thing I think our generation is a lot of pressure and I think because of that pressure it creates the hate it creates the depression that a lot of kids are facing a lot of bullying and I know I know that for a fact that you know it's it's not easy to go through that alone and I think we have to start by being like it's okay like everyone needs to be like it's okay if you don't know what you're wanting. it's okay if you know you have something you want to do or if you want to be gay if you want to be trans and if you want to be something we got to learn how to be be an accepting culture first before we can like make any huge changes cuz well and it's interesting you bring that up because i think uh to charlene's um question 
I don't believe that our generation does know what the melting pot is. Mm -hmm. Mainly because I growing up, I remember when I was a little kid, certain areas that you don't go into. Oh, you don't want to drive through that area of town mm -hmm. because that's, that's predominantly right. Hispanic. You don't mm -hmm. want to go through that area of town because that's mostly Asians. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go through that area of town because that's, that's mm -hmm. mostly black. What, who the hell decided this? <laughs> no, yeah, I no. mean, who in the hell decided this is how we do it? Mm -hmm. Right. And yet they say, oh no, we, we're a country that accepts everybody. No, we're a country that put labels and we stuck people in areas. Yeah, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. We have gatherings. Mm -hmm. We have yeah. gatherings and yeah. I sit and we watch pool, pool, pool. You've got 400 people at a gathering mm -hmm. and you have 16 groups going on and nobody's talking. Mm -hmm. Because once again, from birth, we're taught mm -hmm. to segregate, yeah. but yet we run around saying we're, we're one of the greatest nations because mm -hmm. we accept everybody. We don't. No, what we do is we allow you to come here mm -hmm. so we can give you a label mm -hmm. and we can put you in the category yeah. that you belong to. And we can market to you because <laughs> exactly. we know exactly your spending patterns yeah. and how you work yeah. and what sets you off. Um, and yeah. it's not it's <clears throat> not right. right. It's not. And then we say, you were talking about not wanting to drive mm -hmm. because you don't know. See, why should she feel like that? Mm -hmm. That's ridiculous. Yeah. What so every culture, every race, every nationality, they have their good people and they have their bad people across the yeah. board. Mm -hmm. There is no one race that generates more mm -hmm. than the other. Right. And if anything, if we continue to suppress certain races mm -hmm. by pushing this label, that's what's going to happen. Yeah. If we don't give certain nationalities the same respect as everybody mm -hmm. else and become the melting pot we're supposed to be, mm -hmm. right, right. then they don't get the same opportunities. Right. Yeah. I work with the Miss America organization. Mm -hmm. You want to know why? Because women, even though the glass ceiling was broke, do you know that the, the scholarships for women are so minimal compared to what goes for men. Mm -hmm. So what do they have to do? They have to parade around in a bathing suit. Yeah. Yeah. In order to make money so they can go to college, half of our major businesses, half of our Fortune 500 businesses are run by women today. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. one of them. So it's, it's, it's one of those things that it's just, it kills me when you say one thing, but we're completely the opposite. Mm -hmm. Right. Because in my life, the way I was raised, there is no color. That's right. There is no... We're all people. Like yeah. you said, we all Humanity. shit out the same yep. asshole. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is we didn't we weren't raised that way. Mm -hmm. That was not the way I was raised. And unfortunately, people around me were raised like that, but it's been something that has gone on for years. I'm sure we all saw the movie um, The Help. Yeah. Okay, look back on that. I mean it's some of it was funny, some of it was kind, but that's what it was about. And that's that been carried about. from generation mm -hmm. to generation. Now maybe not as severe, mm -hmm. but because our grand great grandparents were raised that way. They sent it on to their kids, who sent it on to their kids. And now I listen to mothers and fathers when they're talking. Mm -hmm. They don't. I don't think they really realize when they're saying and doing stuff how much it, it impacts yeah. their children. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it, and they're just doing it because it's conversation, mm -hmm. but they don't realize the impact yeah. because yeah. that was the way they were raised. And there's nothing wrong. I mean, they're not doing anything bad. It's right. the way they were raised. Mm -hmm. right. So it's time to say it. Like at my age, say to myself, that. you know what? Madonna's birthday. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing wrong with saying mm -hmm. today that I may not know everything right. and mm -hmm. open my mind up to whatever the new challenges are. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think that's why Ronnie and I get along so well because there was a period of time that he wasn't around that he doesn't know. And there's a period of time that I'm not involved in because I thought to myself, because I'm at that age that. I know everything. I've got everything down pat. I don't need to, I don't need to listen to you. You weren't around when I was doing this, you know. So, and I think that's a problem with my generation moving up is we get into that thing that you don't teach an old dog new tricks. Thank you. And unfortunately, we, we blind ourselves and hence we forget to live. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not living vicariously mm -hmm. through him, but... I'm learning about things that I would normally not be involved in because right. it's beneath me. I'm too old for that, you know. I yeah. mean, I I've got to take, I got to take a couple of salvos and soak my feet because I'm so old now, you know. <laughs> Put an ice bag on my head. That's not the way it works. And I think we stop living when we stop learning. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So it's got to yeah. stop. It's got to stop. So that's all I got to say.
Mm -hmm. I'd like to speak on the millennial melting pot. Um, just as the millennial who's born and raised in Los Angeles, California, mm -hmm. I know that I've had a very different experience than mm -hmm. the rest of the world. There's a lot more tolerance here, mm -hmm. and we're more yeah. of fuck the melting pot, excuse my language, <laughs> uh, express yourself, do you, have your journey, get to your, you have to go through your own process. The minute that you try to put somebody in a melting pot, you're already influencing their ideas. Mm -hmm. You're not allowing them to have their own journey. Therefore, mm -hmm. you're already hurting their lifespan. You're already mm -hmm. trying to predictate um, the way that they respond to things. And what's important for us to, again, embrace is that everyone's on their own journey. Mm -hmm. Whether yes. that means making yes. profitable mistakes that hurt other people mm -hmm. or caring about humanity. I think we're all here to care about humanity. Mm -hmm. um, in in that's different from the melting pot, I think. I think the melting pot is with currency, right? Mm -hmm. The melting pot is clearly what's, um, what's creating currency, what's creating money. You know, I've never liked the term melting pot oh, because yes. it's homogenous, right? Like, we all get here to be homogenous. What makes America great or should make America great is the diversity. We should see what we here yes. as a tossed salad where everybody keeps their own component <laughs> yeah. so we all go well together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 We are, are a tossed salad. Toss, <laughs> <laughs> toss, toss. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things that is an issue is that youth has no idea of yeah. what's taken us to, to go get here. Right. Right. And, right. And, because of and, the and they education. won't. And, and the world's just so. I don't know that it is whether we won't. I think that we do. I, we're ready to move on. Well, I don't think. I don't know if you ever will because whether it will ever come up to be taught mm. is what I'm saying is because trying to make the Holocaust not real and trying to make things that have happened disappear and right. there's only a few people left from the Holocaust and when that ends then that story will change mm, because but, people won't be there to defend the truth. The real that. truth. Yeah. The but real truth. I will say that artists are making that. Yes. Artists, musicians are bridging that gap that we think that's not happening for okay. the millennials. Mm. But I see them walking through artists. But things. it's even younger. It's not. I'm not. No, I'm no, talking no. about before the millennials. I agree. I agree. I agree. The education system needs a full vamp. I mean, as a teacher, mm -hmm. as a former teacher, it needs a full vamp. I've seen things all over the world where kids are experiencing such amazing education in the Asian mm -hmm. community, where they're out running around, touching and feeling, and there's just whole situation of senses and sensory, artists, digital media, all of that is bridging the gap between the millennials, the X generation, the Z generation, et cetera, everybody. Artists are allowing us to experience by ourselves yes. and actually walk in and have an experience without anybody telling us what we should experience. Mm -hmm. So that's getting it there. We're not like completely, we're not saying, okay, you know, let's change the whole history book and teach everybody about the Holocaust. but. Look at the skirball. Look at all these awesome museums that right. are available that are being promoted. Everybody is on the internet and social media, so your millennials are seeing it. Mm -hmm. I, but I still... It won't have the same uh, impact. No, You're no, no, no. Right. no. But, but just like we don't, we don't have anything in our government to take care of our elders. I know. We don't yeah. have that. And the youth isn't taught about that. True. There's, there's no community True. There's that cross-pollinates. It's totally disconnect. Mm. It and, is. It and, is at times. Yes. Uh, being from the gay community, there, I, it's one of the complaints I've had all, all along, is that when you become older, you get discarded, yeah. and if you don't have a circle of friends, you are very much on an island of your own. Yeah. yeah. Whereas the, and, and, it, and it's same thing for any community. If you really do not have friends, you really live on an island as you get older, and it's you true. and you get closed off. And there Even needs jobs. to be, and there's nothing in the government that cr does cross pollinate that, and and it's not even discussed, as it is most of the rights are trying to be taken away from the elders, of and then, then what you, what are we going to do when all those things get disbarred, and how we, how is, how are we? I mean, I'll probably make it through it. It's a generation. After right. me, they probably will not. Maybe if mm -hmm. if things go, they keep on moving the way they are. We don't get somebody in office that actually sees the difference, you know, and and, and starts having that dialogue. Yeah, there's so much lacking humanity, mm -hmm. like I said earlier in our government, that that's what it's. 
I always said a kid should run the government because they haven't been destroyed exactly. yet. Exactly. Mm-hmm. You know, because they just want to have a good time. Yeah. And and make it all work. And um, I don't know. It's but just I, it's it's, well, just, it's a hard it's a hard. But I hear you because my mom is saying the same thing that you know your friends start falling off. Maybe I'm 46. I'm not quite there. But I, I, even myself, I'm a social butterfly. Yet I have my 10 best friends, and now my 10 best friends are becoming five best friends. And then my five best friends are, you know, everything's changing so quickly. So <laughs> as we we are alone when we're coming in and sometimes alone when we're going out, but what we can do, and it starts from the top, is that allocation of money. Look at, look at the other countries. Look at them taking care of their elderly. Norway. Absolutely. Look at the... The Norwegians are just amazing people, and I just, if we could just have some other cultures up in our Congress and they not sit there for 30 years, that needs to change. Mm. You should only serve in Congress more than four years, three years, and that should be a turning module, but we've been, it says, I read it the other day, they can continue for up to 30 years to a lifetime. How are we going to change anything when we've got that same mindset? So that's this kind of scary part that I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. We can talk about all this change, but this Congress itself, you know, would they talk about treason? Treason would wipe out the whole cabinet. The whole cabinet would go. That's kind of the only way that this, it, that's what they say legal-wise, is the only way we're going to get him out of there is if there's treason, and then the whole cabinet will go. So what other choices do we have? I think we have the people's power. Yeah, I think that is the choice. And that's where I get so frustrated sometimes. And again, this is where I try not to be frustrated at people that are frustrated because it only makes more frustration. Because I have to be compassionate and understand everyone has a different experience and everyone's just trying to do the best that they can with what they have, what they know. I am of the mindset very much of the law of attraction, Mm -hmm. about energy and vibration. And what you resist persists. And I say that because I didn't go out to the Women's March last year because it became a Resist Trump march. I didn't go out to the Gay Pride Parade, not this past year, but the one before that because it wasn't a parade. It became a Resist Trump march. Now, feel what you will about that man. The more we continue to resist, Mm -hmm. resist, resist, you're still giving him power, right? And the more we divert that energy into giving power directly, that's less resource and energy that we have to finding the solution. Mm -hmm. If we take that energy, now I'm not saying that protesting is not a good thing. Like there is healthy protesting and it brings awareness and it gets cameras out and you can see what's going on. But I also see in this day and age of media technology that people are going out because it's cool it's like i'm gonna go out and get my selfie at the women's march look there's madonna in the background and you know and that's kind of the extent of it they're not really like doing anything else right they're not calling their legislators they're not trying to come up with solutions and things like that but the same idea is true of creating this political party that was true six years ago when eddie and i were working on creating friend movement a group of artists got together and said we were tired of bullying. We were tired of what it was doing to our communities. We were tired of the suicide rate going up and we were done with it. But what can we do to turn bullying on its head? Well, let's start a movement that's all about friendship, friend movement. Back then we thought we were gonna be the who's who on what friendship was. We were gonna (laughs) teach everybody how to be a good friend and that's what it was gonna be about. But we're finding six years later that the true meaning of friend movement in its new incarnation that's going to happen in October is how do we become a better friend to ourselves? How do we practice self-care and self-love and accepting ourselves? Because let's be honest, before we leave that doorway in the morning and go out into the world, how many of us are looking in the mirror, oh, look at that wrinkle, and I'm this fat and ugly and (laughs) stupid. and We beat ourselves up before the world even gets a chance. And then we're leaving our doors all angry and frustrated, and then we're projecting projecting outward that anger and frustration and, 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 and depression on other people and if they're not in a good place they're gonna take that on themselves like it had anything to do with them but it had nothing to do with them yeah. if we continue this path where we get together and we meet in the middle and we find ways to share information and, and make decisions 
that are best in the greatest interest of all, the greater whole of the country and our interactions with our global partners, you by default resist. You by default resist because when it becomes your turn to get up to the microphone and speak, um, well, we feel this. Well, why do you feel that way? Well, because we have this laundry list of explanations, we have facts and data, and we can prove it. This is how it's gonna work. This is what we would do from day one. Imagine if any one of our People's Party candidates that runs for office, regardless of what that office is, if they were just running on, I'm not that guy, and then they got in there and didn't have a plan, well, now they're just sitting on their hands and they're trying to come up with it on the fly. But if we can work on the solutions now, we could send people out to the protests, but while they're out protesting, let's have an entire like to-do list of what we could be doing on behalf of the party. When you're not out protesting, you know, here's who you can call. This is the legislative, uh, you know, information. I, for example, I, I don't sleep at night. <laughs> like I sleep maybe four or five hours a night, but that's because I'm researching things. I've been looking at the last five years of the United States budgets. I've been looking at the Democratic and Republican party platforms, and by the way, there's the Libertarian, and, and uh, uh, there's like three or four others that I've printed out, and these are 70, 80 pages long to try and understand what they stand for, and it changes every two to four years, you know. They just choose whatever they want to choose every four years. You know, I've been looking at the homelessness problem, 500,000 plus homeless people in the United States, but do you know how many vacant units there are across the country? 17 million. Not including vacant buildings? Yeah. yeah. And granted, not all of them are inhabitable and some are in transition between, but 17 million versus 500,000, <laughs> we have a Section 8 program that yeah. they'll attack and they'll argue about and say that it's not working, but it's underfunded. People are sitting on five, ten year wait lists just to get affordable housing in this country, but then we'll attack the program. You know, or I mean, we, we, we're going to eventually get there to where we dive into all these issues and figure it out. But um, 100 million people didn't vote in 2016. That's crazy. Think about that. I've talked to a lot of people and they said, I didn't vote. I, I said, well, what, made you, what made you do that? What made you just walk away and, and not be a part of it? Oh, just, you know, the long lines and I had to work and I don't, you know, so a lot of it was just people not wanting to take any responsibility whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, and realistically, in today's economy, people are working two and three different jobs. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about education? Well, how do you educate people? How to make it cool to be involved in government? I remember when I took the Constitution test in eighth grade, we weren't all that excited about having to take it. The teachers weren't all that excited about teaching it. Mm -hmm. But our government's pretty cool when it comes down to it and the checks and balances, but you would never really know it because it's so dry and bland and people don't you know, want to get involved. But artists, what if we use artists? What if we, we live in Hollywood, we live in Los Angeles area? Like, get the artist to make content. Like Hamilton, how Hamilton. Yeah, Hamilton, listen, I have <laughs> Hamilton on my car on repeat. I cannot wait to see Hamilton in New York City because it educates and it teaches us about our country's history, but it makes it fun. Yeah. It makes it exactly. cool. It makes yeah. it interesting, you know. And so how do we tap into that 100 million voters? And this is where I will argue uh, and I will shout from the highest you know, rooftop that there is a need and a viability for a third party uh, successful uh, group. Because there's 100 million people to tap into that didn't vote in 2016. After the 2016 election, 42 percent, uh, according to Gallup that were polled, identified as independent, which basically said that people didn't feel like the Democrats or the Republicans were actually making change that made sense. And then you've got 83 million millennial voters coming into age, 2018, 2020, and you've got another 58 million that are moderate Republican Democrats. Right, so they're not party loyalists. They, 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 they generally side with one or the other, but they can swing and they see the value of coming to the middle. To the middle. Mm -hmm. They see the reason in talking about these issues and not just um, picking a side because you're told to or picking a side because you, know, uh, you haven't even questioned the leader. You, they just told you to do it and you did. So the need is there and um, I wanted to just read a little passage. Uh, 
Republicans and Democrats don't agree or even like each other, and it's worse than ever. This was written October 5th, 2017, NPR Politics by Jessica Taylor. The partisan split in America is the highest it's been in two decades, with Republicans and Democrats holding vastly desperate views on race, immigration, and the role of government, according to a new study from the Pew Research Center. Pew has been measuring attitudes on policy issues and political values going back to 1994, and its latest check-in finds, perhaps unsurprisingly, that Americans are more divided than ever. The fact that Republicans and Democrats differ on these fundamental issues is probably not a surprise, but the magnitude of the difference is striking, and particularly how the differences have grown in recent years and where they've grown. Pew asked more than 5,000 respondents this summer about 10 specific political issues, including governmental regulation and aid, same-sex marriage, and environmental regulations, and found that on average there's a 36-point gap between Republicans and Democrats. That's a whopping 21-point increase since it even began tracking those same questions 23 years ago. So there's a 36-point gap between Republicans and Democrats. They're not just like having minor discrepancies on where they feel like they need to have room for compromise, but you've got an entire 36-point gap. They're so radically divided, again, going back to the idea that the American people are the kids of a divorce, we're in the middle while they keep fighting, or we, while they keep shouting and fist pumping and stomping their feet and having tantrums about who's right or wrong, instead of looking at the material and figuring out what's best for the people. Partisanship has risen markedly since 2004, which was the year that President Bush was reelected, and it has hit an all-time high. Two decades before, there was about a 15-point gap between Republicans and Democrats on these issues, but it wasn't much more pronounced than uh, in the differences of race and religion. Um, you know, so that's one thing. And here's an interesting little thing that I'd like to do. Um, I don't agree with everything that's in here. But it makes you think. <laughs> this is 50 reasons to bail out of the two-party system and become an independent voter. So I'll go off and maybe we can just go around the room and read a couple because it'll be more fun that way. Uh, so the two-party system came into existence at a time when people were still writing on paper with feathers dipped in ink. And partisanship is, is as antiquated as that practice because we have better ways of accomplishing that same purpose today. Parties were invented because it was impossible in the late 1700s to have all the facts about a candidate for public office. So people relied on their party for direction about who to vote for. Makes sense, right? We no longer need parties for this purpose in the age of the internet and social media. It is easy to find all the facts you might want to know about a candidate for public office yourself. People are already leaving the two parties at an accelerating rate, and being non-affiliated with a party is actually now the most common partisan affiliation in America. There's a reason for this. Most Americans, other than the most fiercely loyal pol political partisan, believe that the two-party system is tearing the country apart. And as Americans, leave the parties and become independent voters, they leave behind the most extreme partisan loyalists, which has made the parties even more extreme and intolerable to the majority of Americans. Most Americans, other than the most fiercely loyal political partisans, believe that the two-party system is tearing apart. Sorry, I, re I repeated. But the extremism, extremism is not extremism in defense of principle or consistency. The Republican Party preaches limited government and fiscal conservatism, but through eight years of Reagan, four years of Bush, and eight years of W. Bush, it raised federal budgets and deficits to record levels in 2001. The Democratic Party preaches civil liberties and solidarity with workers, but through eight years of Clinton and eight years of Obama, it vastly expanded the police state and entrenched corporate interests. <clears throat> Number 11, in fact, both of the two major political parties in America are constantly switching positions on issues based on whether they are in power or not. 
In doing so, they also create a landscape of high uncertainty and volatility. 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 Wow. It's hard to say. It's a twister. Mm -hmm. When it comes to things like taxes and regulatory policy, this is unfair to the public and it spooks businesses and discourages growth. On the back. That was on the back. On the back. That one on the back. There it goes. The parties also do this over procedural issues in the legislature, like raising the debt ceiling and file busters, filibusters. Sorry. In fact, both of the two major pol political parties in America are constantly switching positions on issues based on whether they are in power or not. W. E. Mesimore, IBM, independent author. Democrats, when a Democrat is a POTUS and the economy is doing well, look how great the economy is doing. Republicans, when a Democrat is POTUS, is POTUS, the economy is doing well. The president can't take the credit for it now. The entire economy is doing. Besides, this is the result of the past president of his office, who is Republican. Republicans, when a Republican is POTUS, is the economy is doing well. Look how great the economy is doing. Democrats when a Republican is POTUS and the economy is doing well. The president can't take credit for how the entire economy is doing. Besides, this is the result of the last president who was in office, who was a Democrat. Uh, 18. And Democrats and Republicans keep having this conversation with a straight face every four to eight years and switch sides like it doesn't matter. Anything that causes a suspiciously timed mass amnesia on a regular basis is something very bad and we shouldn't get it and we should get it out of our system and never go back to it again. Thomas Jefferson swore, if I could not go to heaven, but with a party, I would not go there at all. Mm. In, his 19, in his 1796 farewell address, George Washington said, I don't know what he said. <laughs> I think he said there were days. Oh, that's yes. what he said too. Okay. There were days both no, I don't think that's these what he said. Nope, that's not it. Yeah. I don't know what he said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, these days, what both parties agree on is worse than what they, what they disagree over. They are both beholden to the special interest of the finance sector, yes. public yep. sector unions, and the military industrial complex. And regardless of what they say and when they make campaign promises, both parties come together to hog up and transfer as many resources as they possibly can to these special interest groups. Facts, they're only into their own agenda. Okay, so then there's a tweet that says, these days, what both parties agree on is worse than what they disagree over. 23 says, small, business, small businesses and the middle class continue to suffer as a result of this. People and businesses should be rewarded for contributing to something of value to society and persuading society to reward them with profits for the enticement of some added value. Mm -hmm. The parties work to cull votes by promising political favors and influence that those rewards who are and influence that rewards those who are good at lobbying and not producing. 24. Uh, this limits our I can't even see because I'll be staring at <laughs> This limits our, our productive possibilities as a society and creates corruption. We are materially much worse off for uh, much worse off for it not better off as a result of it and we are doing very well in spite of it so think of how much better we could be doing if resources flow to their most productive uses okay. not into the hands of those good at lobbying at, uh, and peddling political influence should I read 25 also or sure okay. <laughs> 25 uh, the entrenched, the entrenched establishment created and maintained by the two-party system also protects its position in the economy by lobbying politicians to create costly barriers to entry, uh, to entry to their industry for startups and small businesses in the form of high regulatory compl uh, compliance costs. This hurts economic growth, it's, un it's unfair to entrepreneurs, and it's unfair to consumers who are missing out on something better because entrenched, entrenched special interests would uh, rather lobby for cover from competition than stay competitive themselves. Right. 
And what's this called? 50 what? So this is 50 reasons, reasons to bail out of the two-party system and become independent. And who wrote it? This is uh, by W.E. Messamore. Okay. And he is an entrepreneurship major and graduate of Belmont University. Okay. We also suffer from the mental poison that this system creates. It engenders never-ending tribalistic group warfare over public resources and the establishment always wins. Mm -hmm. So the two-party system leaves many Americans at each other's throats in an exploitative Machiavellian divide and conquer strategy way. And no partisan voter can live without their daily two minutes of hate the other side a really potent and venomous kind of vitriol that the system thrives on, but it isn't really good for society at all, or for any individual's mental health or overall well-being in any way. But what's really insidious about it is that this is all for show, and in the end, the same two parties that stir up so much division ultimately serve the same special interests. Mm -hmm. So the never-ending turf war over the levels of power in government is just a distraction. The two-party state in America is really a one-party state, like the one-party rule of the Communist Party government in the, in the People's Republic of China. It's a one-party state disguised as a two-party state, because one-party rule would be unacceptable to most Americans, but that's what we really have. That's evident enough in how the two parties collaborate to keep any third parties out of any position of, re of relevance in politics. Take, for instance, the Commission on Presidential Debate and how it works to keep third party candidates off the national debate stage with Republicans and Democrats, or state voting laws that have written the two party system right into the, their electoral processes in a bid to keep independent candidates and third party candidates away. Americans have an inherent disdain for any system that is rigged. We generally believe in giving everyone a fair chance. Well, who could deny that elector electoral politics in the United States has been rigged by the two-party system? I like that. They've been saying one nation forever, and it's actually being said here. Mm -hmm. The last one. Okay. You, number 36? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the best the Republican Party could do in 2016 was a reality television celebrity and real estate mogul who bragged on the stage about how much influence he's brought from politicians. Let's see here. The best the Democratic Party could do in 2016 was a Wall Street bought and paid for establishment shill who was one of the people whose influence the Republican candidate had bought. The Republican candidate won almost without any party fundraising, proving it is now possible with the internet and social media for an independent candidate with a resonant message to win without a party apparatus. Um, 39, his victory in the GOP primary, while certainly cynical in many ways, demonstrated how irrelevant in it is now possible to make polit political parties in the 21st century. Independent voters and candidates, as well as third-party candidates, should waste no time in capitalizing on this opportunity. Number 40. Okay. The Democratic candidate rigged their party's primary and potentially stole the nomination from a true reform candidate with an independent streak and stole a lot of their party's money from local and state elections to sink into their presidential bid. This is now a matter of record that party insiders along along with leaks, have made public knowledge. After so brazen an act of systematic and institutional corruption, how can any one count on the Democratic Party again to pick its political candidates in a fair process? The Democratic Party's lawyers arguing its case in court when sued for donations to be returned to Bernie Sanders supporters after the election rigging became public, argued successfully that political parties have no legal obligations to keep any of their promises. <laughs> this was a legal yeah. defense. Yeah. This was a legal defense. That's something we should already know about political parties by now, but it's fascinating to see how a political party uses it as legal defense. 
When you become an independent voter, you don't have to worry about a party keeping its promises to you or using your donations wisely and fairly. You don't have to compromise your own beliefs to do mental acrobats to defend your party's actions when they do something wrong. You can just be honest and speak your mind truthfully at all times without having to worry about it'll hurt your party and that's the other party is lying too. So the only way to fight back is to stretch the truth a little. 46. So that's a law they enacted. They did, I mean, they have no, they, they have no uh, obligation. Okay. They have no obligation. Okay. They argued that and, and it was fine. <laughs> because parties make up their own rules, essentially. Okay. okay. You can plant two feet firmly on solid ground of 100% consistency of everything you've ever said about politics over a long span of time. It's a good feeling. It's just so honest and clean and pure and strong. You'll have a cleaner conscience and an, independ and, an independent than anyone who engages in the dirty business of partisan politicking. You can start fresh and reapproach all the complex issues of politics with an open mind and not feel like you have to believe something about a given issue because your party does. Exploring these issues could be interesting and fun again. At 48, you don't have to stay committed to a never-ending fight. 49, it's not hard to change party affiliation. It's easy. <laughs> and in a majority of states, you can still vote in the primary. So if you're in one of those states, you don't even have that excuse not to bail out of the two-party system and become an independent voter in 2018. Yes, independent. <laughs> so if you needed a reason, and here's 50 That's pretty strong great. reasons. I'm going to post that. <laughs> That's I mean, I have so much, but, you know, to conserve paper and the environment, I didn't print out a lot of stuff. No. Yeah, we can get that was yeah. I can send you a lot of things digitally that yeah. I found. And listen, I'm uncover I'm turning over every stone and I'm trying to figure out who's writing it and why and what their agenda is and what their motive is and what their skew is. But there's a lot of stuff out there outside of the mainstream media that we can be finding and paying attention to that is very valid, that has reputable sources. Yeah. So you know, this just gives you something to think about. And again, you know, I think it's like comedy. It, it picks apart both sides pretty well. It it's is. not singling out one or the other. It's just saying, hey, American people, look at the system. There's a lot of components of it that is serving you, but there's a lot of components that are not. And it talks about the financial sector specifically because the financial bailout in 2008 do you know how there are still 3,000 financial lobbyists on payroll today wow. that are going and whining and dining both Democrats and Republicans right. to get their vote? Right. You know, so where do the American people actually have a say we when, don't. I mean, you really don't. But, um, but yeah, I mean, this is a great start. Uh, I know that it, we are running a little bit over time now, so I guess I just want to um, table the other part of new business till our next meeting, which is going to be nominating a party chair and creating of subcommittees to start dissecting each of the issues and kind of coming up with a party platform. Um, but this is a wonderful start because the FEC actually needs, um, it needs us to do a, a checklist of things and one of those things is document and record meeting minutes and have a history of meeting and uh, spending a certain dollar amount and even getting um, a certain number of uh, names on a petition. So this is just the beginning. What's okay. the dollar amount? Uh, I think it's like sp you have to spend or raise a thousand dollars and then you're a committee. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And again, Wikipedia How is fantastic. That's really good. Cool. I mean, you can Wikipedia How just about anything. Okay. And uh, well, that's a good question, though. Have you verified the information you've Yes. Yeah. Okay. Multiple, <laughs> okay. Okay. Multiple sources. Yeah. Okay. Multiple sources. Yeah. Multiple sources. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you know, tonight we have uh, taken a moment to identify the need for a viable third party, you know, and I think we're going to continue with that effort moving forward. I don't know if it's a done deal, it's explorative. Uh, there's certainly a lot more to be done on the research front. We've identified that we are maybe Republican and Democratic and independent minds coming to the table to talk about the tough issues, but in a respectful way to listen to one another and try and see if there are middle ground solutions. Are there ways that we can, on both sides of the aisle, uh, make compromises for the greater trajectory, you know, for the country, for the people, 
not just uh, the big business and oligarchs, and I think it's time that the people actually have a true voice. Um, what else? What else? What else? What else? I mean, that's a lot. <laughs> we did a lot. I guess let's finish the meeting just with a. Um, let's finish the meeting with. Uh, let's see. My mom has a question. <laughs> I love you, mom. She says, so the goal is to communicate to all people that they have more than two options and should follow their ideals when voting. Yes. yes. Mom's on to it. Mom's on to it. No, I mean, that's absolutely right. There are more than two options out there, but the system feeds itself, so right. the Democratic and Republican Party candidates are also the heads of the networks and the heads of the producers of the media. So, yeah. again, they'll tell you what you want to hear and hype it up on steroids so you get excited about it and they do what you want to do, but it's always about this or this narrative moving forward. That's all it is. It's Think about it as storytelling. This party, this party, they both want their narrative to move forward. If this party stops them, then that narrative doesn't go. Yeah, forward. but they also do. They also do that because they don't want the third party to take away from the other from the other votes. Right. So they try to right. destroy the third party because they feel the third party will damage Hillary. Like you know, like yeah. if it wasn't for Bernie, yeah. Hillary would have won. You know that that type of thing, which is not which really well, it, might not have been the truth. It's monkey in the middle, right? right. It's like. Democrats, Republicans, and then we the people are in the middle just trying to get the ball, but they keep passing it back and forth to right. one another, and it's much easier to just villainize any viable third-party candidate right. or party itself by saying, they're going to ruin it for us, and you're going to be left with the worst of two evils, the monster, the monster, the monster, and they keep pointing at the monster and that fear. You, you talked about fear earlier, and um, Adolf Hitler said, I use emotion for the masses and I reserve reason for the few. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for that. Because with the masses, if you can instill fear, you can govern far of course. with less friction, right? Mm -hmm. Because people will just do what they're told. But if you give people more art and more opportunities to train their analytical mind and more uh, resources to educate themselves with facts and other voices that aren't the Democratic and Republican and that's a threat to that duopoly of power. At least they know if they're out for four years or eight years, they're going to be back in power in another four or eight, and it keeps going back and forth. Um, but yeah. Okay, thank you, Mom, for that question. And uh, I just wanted to end the meeting on uh, just a general note on how you felt about coming, how you felt during, and how... Or you even ask me for this and it's just like I think it's great to know that there's people out there that want to come together and create a balance and actually like make a difference and that's that's what I, that's what I want to do is to make a difference as well and if this is a start of it then I'm more than happy to be a part of it thank you for being here yeah um on paper. Um, I'm kind of behind the scenes. I'm signing petitions. I'm showing up. Yes, I'm doing marches, but my women's march was for, you know, my family, my people who have been raped and people who have been molested, you know, the, the people that need voices, women who have been you know, ripped apart. So I didn't, I not only was excited at the energies of these marches, was was beautiful to see all these women coming together and men. Um, but I think I'm ready to move forward and, and be active and responsible uh, to, to make that change and be a part of it. And I'm not afraid. Mm -hmm. And I don't have that fear anymore. And I think that's what's been my drive is that, what am I fearing? I can die any day. I've been hit by a car. I'm on my 10th life. I've got to do it. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say thank you for being here and being a part of it. The small will grow great. That's right. Yes. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the food. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you can forget it. Yeah. <laughs> it's only a lot of pineapple upside down things. Brought chips. Uh, <laughs> chips. Right, there's new chips and dip. Uh-huh. 
I think what's really cool is to sit here and listen to everybody, and I hope that this table discussion tonight got some other people inspired to move forward with their opinions and educate. Because I'm sure tonight, as we sat here, even though we listened to each other, we were very respectful, um, there are things that maybe we don't agree with with the other person, but it was how we chose to deal with it. Mm -hmm. We were able to give our side of it, incorporate another person's opinion, elaborating with that, but in as we continue to move back and forth, we learn something from each other because we see different perspectives on different issues. And in some areas, I even heard of things tonight, I was listening to Randy on something he said that I didn't even know about. So by listening to him, now I have that, that education to go along with what I already know. Mm. So it's not about being right here tonight. It's not about being whatever I say goes, it's about having an opinion mm -hmm. and having a forum in which we were all able to speak freely. There was no animosity, there was no hate. Um, it's very disturbing to look at things of, of our society and the people here that are going down. What is one of our big things, the Hollywood Walk of Fame? I mean, we have tourists come from all over the world and, and what's, what is it we're focused on? We're focused on somebody out there with a pickaxe, yeah. smashing up Trump's star. Then that really shows, and of course, thank God for our journalism and all of our network television shows and news teams that now have broadcast us across the globe. We look like morons. It was pathetic, it was stupid. Hey, I understand everybody has high emotions where he's concerned, I get it, I, I'm not, saying that you can't feel that way, but to destroy the things that we have, it, it, it's ridiculous. And to show that, and now it's televised, it's all over the place. And what do other countries think of? We, mm. When I was growing up, I was always told we were, the, we were the greatest country in the world. I wonder what other people think. We're, we're like a mockery. I mean, we're idiots. we're idiots. We're idiots. We don't, China and the rest of them, they look at how we treat our elderly. They would never do that there. Uh, I talk to kids that are here um, on the the exchange student program. They're here. They speak English, German, mm. Dutch, French, Italian, and I'm like, and it's, I'm like, why would you take all that? Oh, that's that's required. And I'm sitting here looking at them, and to them, it's no big deal. They massive amounts of work, but they still have a good time. Why here, yeah. if we're asked, our kids are asked to take Spanish or French or Italian, mm -hmm. it's a meltdown. Mm -hmm. I mean, the best they come out after four years of school, I know that that was for me in Spanish, was esta Susana en casa, and I'm still not sure what the hell that means. <laughs> all I know is I've got great diction and I sound good. <laughs> so that's all I got out of it. And yet they're speaking all these languages fluently. fluently. And it's part of their curriculum. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we're not talking about a place somewhere else that has more money or more this. It's where their focus is. Mm -hmm. mm. So what the hell is going on here? Right. Where's our focus? So where your focus is, yeah. that's, that's right. It, it, it's so, you know, one day, these kids that are in school today are going to be the ones that are going to be ruling the nation. Mm -hmm. And I need to know now that when I get to be 80 years old, I'm watching my mother struggle. She spent her whole life working and she's struggling. You know, mm. or my stepfather passed away, she's on her own, she's a widow. I watch her struggle. And the programs for her are like next to nothing. You know, you're out. You know, if you are an elderly person that saves some money, but you had an, you know, a stroke. I watch my, my aunt and my uncle. When they had strokes, they never thought that would happen. That changed the whole playing field. So a million dollars worth of savings, two caregivers maintaining a home, and the fact that, oh, well, you own a house, so you're not entitled to anything. Medication isn't covered. I watched in two years all of that squandered away to caregivers, medical programs, hospitals, transportation. It wasn't a, 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 an ornate lifestyle medications that when she had coverage with her insurance was ten dollars but now it's a thousand dollars and she only gets half that prescription because if she wants more it's twenty five hundred 
And the only way they'll come in and help her is if she decides to go completely broke. So I had to wait till she had no money before they would help and I wasn't gonna let that happen, so I balanced it. But what about the people out there that didn't make that kind of money? That did okay, again, like the middle class. The middle class is gone. So now, they're well, on we're the street. Here. We're here, still here. We're barely here. barely hanging on. But, but, we're, but we are being, um, we're being eliminated. taking things away. Things are being yeah. taken away, and that's okay, and we're making do, such as my parking got taken away. Yeah. You know, I have to take the train now, and therefore, I'm dealing with newer people. You know, so again, it's, it's, uh, it's taking away, and then we're having to get more creative, which is mm -hmm. forcing me to be more creative, to come up a way mm -hmm. to find my own company so that I don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's doing to me okay. personally. Mm -hmm. But I think my point, so I can wrap this up because I can go on all night long. Shut up. So, <laughs> he's not, I, he's not, I didn't not, say anything. Not he's not present. I was just yet, going so. like this though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, know, I, know. I go on forever. Um, it's just that it's nice to see that there's a forum where everybody can get together and, and do this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. So for me, it's just having the dialogue and having people that are like-minded and be able to start making it more um, vocal. You know, you talk about it with certain friends and you, you have that dialogue, but it's not, it's not broad enough yet. And now we have, what we need to do is branch out and spider out, make the web much bigger to have more people that want to be supportive in a third party and making the third party actually intelligent and viable because we've had some very idiotic third parties that are not very illiterate. They just decided they'd run because they have the money. And yeah. this time it has to be very um, smart and educated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel that there's so many things that we can bring up to support our United States that will actually take care of we the people. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I came tonight because I've been over the last two years frustrated, scared, um, angry, and I've come to terms with that. But one thing when I was talking to my friend here is about, okay, so now what are you going to do about it? And so even being invited to a table to have my ideas heard like who is at the table where decisions are being made and so that was important to me I'm also very pragmatic and so you know I appreciate that a lot of this is about the third party because it's like for me it, it, the stakes are very high and so anything I put my energy towards I, I want to feel like you know that it, it's going to work and so I'm excited as this moves on to drill down on the actual issues and what's actually going to make this a viable solution mm -hmm. that's right yes. <laughs> Same thing, I'm beyond thankful for this safe space for us to come and like chat and like hear from the South, hear from the West Coast, you know, and you're just like, and you know, just be united, right? Because like all of our experiences are so different. So I'm thankful for that. And I'm really thankful for social media for showing us, we call them idiots, but like people who are just on a different like wavelength, you know? That's right. yeah. So like I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for all of the platforms, for the safe space, for the social media to show us people who aren't in our immediate circle, right? You get to show us, we'll say being an idiot or being a selfie no, lover or whatever. Just a different being, word. No, yeah, we should use yeah. a different word. Materialistic, right? We get to see, you get to show all of us how you're acting versus just showing, versus just keeping it contained within your inner circle. That makes us be able to reach you better, right? So that we can help you and kind of be like, that selfie is dope, but look at what's behind you. Like, <laughs> look at everything, you know? So I'm thankful. <laughs> Uh, I guess I, I came here to listen and, and learn. It was very educational, very enlightening. And there's so many things I heard uh, from people around the table that I agreed with. Uh, um, I think uh, 
Eddie said something about, you know, we shouldn't be yelled, uh, yelled at or cursed at we're just because we, like, hey, we want this third guy that, you know, we kind of like. You know, and Randy talked about, um, you know, taking care of our elderly, our veterans. You know, this is a country that has money for everything. You can we get do. money to support anything. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be, uh, you know, a situation where the elderly, the veterans, or basically with the homeless, whoever needs, uh, you know, care to be just cast aside and be like, hey, you're on your own, you don't have money, we're not, mm -hmm. we can't do anything for you. So I'm glad that there are people around this table, and I'm sure hopefully this is reflective of people in, uh, in our country that are feeling that way, that, that need some sort of a change and want to do something about it. Yes, and thank you for your camera skills. Yes. Yes. <laughs> don't go over watching. <laughs> Yeah. Already said. You went. Okay. Everybody yeah. went. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've got to go. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your turn. Um, okay. So, I guess coming into the meeting, I too was very excited and very scared. And I think that's natural. I think that's human emotion. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. not always easy to kind of pin down. And I think that's sometimes one of the challenges we face in our personal relationships and on a political scale is when you're feeling emotional you react instead mm -hmm. of respond when you take a mo moment you take a beat you take a deep breath and you think about it give yourself that room then you can come back and 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 respond instead of react and I was a little nervous going in for a lot of reasons as you can imagine it's a little cray cray to think that <laughs> you're gonna go and start a whole party and you know when I you know a lot of times you know people in my inner circle they know me as cray cray and they embrace it because you know I'm crazy enough to think I can change the world and like Steve Jobs said it's those people that think That's that they right. can actually do oh, and uh, all of these parties, including the Republicans and Democrats, started at a table like this. They started yeah. small with a group of like-minded individuals that just wanted to see change. And I came in very nervous, and I came in, what are they going to think of me? And I came in thinking, oh, there's people that know me as a model or as an actor. Or own it can be very intimidating so I had a lot of these things kind of swirling through my mind and I don't really have uh, I showed up and I you know I was lying in bed well who's gonna even come are they gonna be all LA flakes <laughs> and not come you know and I was gonna be sitting here with Eddie and I love you Eddie but <laughs> 10 years 10 years well I think fear drives a lot of oh fear yeah. does yeah. yeah I was trying to figure out how fear to get out doubt. of this fear got me here fear and fear and doubt yeah and and we can let that we can let fear and doubt paralyze us but I think everything that we want in our personal lives and, and the change we want to see and be in this country is just on the other side of fear. Yeah. It's yeah. just That's on the right. other side yeah. of fear. And when you feel the fear yeah. and you do it anyway, even if you get scuffed up a little bit and you have a bruise, That's right. you know, you're better for it and you can learn from your mistakes. Kind of full circle back to the beginning of the mm -hmm. meeting. We have light and dark parts and we're all on our journey. We're at different places, learning different lessons. And it just, it's going to take a little patience. It's going to yeah. take a little empathy. But recognizing that there's something that needs to be done is the first step. And I think we've accomplished that here tonight. Yes. And I'm so grateful that you guys have taken time out of your busy lives and schedules. Because you could be anywhere in the world right now that you want to. I drove through Bel-Air. <laughs> I was on my way here. <laughs> but you guys are so smart and so passionate and so articulate. And I cannot wait to see where this group goes from here. And thank you to everybody listening. Um, I hope you guys uh, stay involved. I've already uh, purchased the website for the USA People's Party, so it's already the domain is there. And so the, everything that we do from here on out, we can kind of figure it out. Okay. Yeah, it's All gonna right. be an adventure. Yay. And more people come. Don't yeah. be afraid. Don't be afraid. <laughs> so Don't be afraid. thank you guys. Have a safe and wonderful rest of your evening, and thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.